Today is another modal race video, sort of, but instead of the usual 250 to 300 miles, we're traveling about four miles. Today it's bike versus bus versus car in lovely Portland, Oregon. And we're gonna break down the advantages and disadvantages of each mode and total them up for a full year with some kind of mind-blowing results once we get to the end. It's all up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always appreciated. And today's topic is no exception. Here was the comment which came in on my Montreal to Toronto high-speed rail race video. I'm enjoying these intercity transportation mode race videos. Perhaps you should consider doing intra-city transportation mode races. Car versus transit versus bike. This was from viewer Greg Vasilakos, who also suggested the idea for my transit to beaches video. You know, I might have to put Greg on the payroll, but I might have to learn to pronounce his name correctly first. So here's what we're doing today. It's not exactly a race, but it's definitely a competition. Our three contestants live in Southeast Portland at Southeast 50th Avenue and Division Street, which six years ago looked like this. You ever use this time slider in Street View? It's pretty fun. Anyway, 50th and Division now looks like this. All three work downtown office jobs. Remember downtown office jobs? Is that even a thing anymore? And all three of their jobs are at office buildings that are within a block of Pioneer Courthouse Square AKA Portland's living room. They all have work days that start at 8.30 a.m. and go to 5 p.m. And as with my other race videos, each one of them is using a different mode of transportation. Caleb is going to drive his car, Tammy is taking transit, and Brianna is gonna ride her bike. What I'm gonna do here is go through the morning commute, looking at the route, the travel time, and the out-of-pocket cost. And I'll do the same for the PM commute, but then make sure to stay to the end because what I'm gonna do is total up all the costs and benefits for a whole year of commuting. And I think the final tally is going to be really eye-opening. There's more to explain as I go through, but you know, let's just get straight into it. Let's start with our driver, Caleb, and work back backwards to see what he has to do to get to work by 8.30. First of all, his car. Let's say he drives an eight-year-old Honda Civic. He's paying $135 a month for a dedicated parking space at his apartment. Otherwise, he'd constantly be having to find street parking around Division Street, which if you know Portland is kind of a nightmare. And then he might have to move his car around on weekends to make sure it didn't get towed. He doesn't want to deal with any of that, so he's paying 135 bucks for the privilege of just being able to walk down to his dedicated parking stall and get in his car. Google says Powell Boulevard to the Hawthorne Bridge is going to be the best bet on most mornings, but in reality, he probably uses like Waze or Google or Apple to help with routing because the optimal path is going to vary from morning to morning. But let's say on average his morning commute is going to be a quote unquote 14 to 35 minute drive. So in order to be really confident that he's going to get to work by 8:30, which is important, he needs 35 minutes. And let's say he's absolutely committed to driving every day. So he bought monthly parking at a downtown garage a block away from work. And at that location, it's about $250 a month. On the downtown end of his trip, it takes him five minutes to get to his spot, park, and walk to his building. So he really needs to be in his car by 7.50 a.m. It's a five mile trip to Pioneer Courthouse Square using the route that Google suggests. Let's see, gas in Multnomah County is $3.86 a gallon right now. A 2013 Civic gets about 28 miles a gallon. So that's 69 cents. Of course, there are more costs, but we'll spend some time on insurance, maintenance, and depreciation when we get to the year end summary. But man, it's kind of a lot already. Okay, let's check in on Tammy. For the bus, 50th and Division is actually a pretty great location. You've got Line 2, which runs on Division about every seven or eight minutes in the AM peak. And then you've got Line 14, which runs up 50th and then down Hawthorne about every 15 minutes. So Tammy can aim to take Line 2, which has a scheduled 8 a.m. departure. But if she misses it, there's a line 14 that shows up at 8.03. And it's possible the bus will get stuck in traffic, but some of that's built into the bus schedule. And also, line two runs on the transit mall downtown, which 
has dedicated lanes for bus and light rail. So the bus is gonna miss some of the congestion that a car would hit. Bus fare is 250 a ride, but TriMet caps it at $100 a month if you use their hop card. So that's what we'll go with when we do the year end wrap up. Also worth noting that Tammy can maybe get something productive done with her time on the bus, but those 8 a.m. buses are pretty crowded, so I wouldn't bank on it. Okay, let's check in on Brianna. Quickly, let's orient you to Portland's neighborhood greenway system because that's really important here. Neighborhood greenways are low traffic streets that are designated for bike priority. Some cities call these bike boulevards. In Portland, they decided there are a lot of benefits for people walking to, so they didn't want to limit the concept or the branding by having the word bike in the name. Neighborhood greenways are marked with Sharrows and they include traffic calming to keep speeds low and access restrictions that are intended to keep motor vehicle volumes below 2,000 a day, hopefully more like 1,000. So Google is recommending the Clinton Greenway, which I believe is the most heavily used greenway in the whole city, but Lincoln's more direct and it's a perfectly good route. So Brianna's gonna take Lincoln through Lad's Edition to the Hawthorne Bridge and it ends up being a 22 minute ride to work. And let's assume there's a secure bike room at her office, which in my experience is usually the case in Portland. So she can pretty safely leave home at 8.05. One thing I can't emphasize enough, unlike driving or taking the bus, a bike trip is absolutely consistent. There's no gridlock. There's no waiting multiple cycles at a signal. You get the same predictable travel time every time, plus or minus like one minute. Occasionally you'll get a flat or some other mechanical issue, but that's probably less than 1% of trips. And the price? free other than maintenance and depreciation, which we'll touch on at the end of the video. One other thing I'm going to total up here is calories burnt. I'm going to assume all three of them walk about the same, but I'm going to credit Brianna eight calories a minute for riding her bike. So that's 176 calories burnt on the morning commute. Just to anticipate another question here, weather. For today's video, I'm assuming a completely median day for Portland, which is probably something like mid-October. Morning commute is probably in the mid 40s, so wear layers, but it's probably no precipitation. Evening commute might be around 60 degrees. And worth noting, it's a downhill commute. You're not really gonna break a sweat, so just wear your work clothes. It's the Portland way. Okay. Now let's do the PM commute and we'll start with Brianna. The ride home is actually longer because it's uphill. It's 27 minutes. Google is pretty much on the money here, but for the ride home, I am gonna put Brianna on the Clinton Greenway, just because eh, it's what I'd do. Clinton is a gentler climb and it's closer to places where you might stop for a beverage on the way home. And it's gonna burn more calories than the morning commute, about 218. So maybe you earn the occasional beverage on the way home. Tammy's evening commute is straightforward. She gets on the first available bus after five o'clock, which is a line two that leaves at 5.04 and is scheduled to get her home at 5.30. The fare is 2.50, but let's just hang out here and talk about how traffic affects the bus. It used to be quite a bit worse getting from the transit mall to the Hawthorne Bridge. But a couple of years ago, the city put this protected bike and bus lane on Southwest Madison Street, and it really improved the travel time and reliability for buses that are going eastbound over the Hawthorne Bridge. For line two, which is gonna be replaced by the new Frequent Express service, late next year. Most of the traffic issues, I believe, are on Division Street at this point. The big culprit, in my experience, is this five-way offset intersection where LAD, 20th, and 21st come together at Division. The signal phasing is pretty challenging because of all the different conflicting movements, so Division doesn't get that much green time. You can definitely be sitting in an eastbound bus here for a couple of cycles. Again, it's kind of built into the schedule, but just an idea I'm throwing out there. Close the lad leg of this intersection. For Caleb's evening commute, let's just say it takes him five minutes to get out of the garage. Queues at garage exits can be pretty bad at the PM peak, so I'm probably cutting him some slack here. Google is sending him down to the Ross Island Bridge and then down Powell, and it gives a pretty wide range of potential travel times, 18 to 40 minutes. So I'm gonna say that averages out to 29, even though I'm skeptical. 
and gas is gonna be 77 cents. Okay, before we get to the final results, quick reminder, if you're enjoying the video, drop a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Okay, housekeeping done, on to the year-end summary. So let's go through Caleb's totals. First, how much is he spending? Well, I've got $1.46 for gas every day. I'm gonna say 250 work days in a year, so that's $365. And really, gas is the cheapest part of owning a car. He was paying $135 a month for parking at his apartment and $250 downtown. Times 12 months, that's $4,620 year for parking. Maintenance on a used Civic, I'm going to call it $400 a year. Auto and liability insurance, about $1,500. And I'm not going to worry about whether he has like a monthly car payment. That isn't the right way to do the accounting anyway. The bottom line is he has a depreciating asset on his personal balance sheet. And the average annual depreciation on a used Civic is something like $1,500. So the total personal cost per year for the privilege of driving to work downtown comes out to $7,985. There's a lot there. Just let me know if you want to quibble with any of my assumptions. For time spent, I'm saying 40 minutes in the AM because he has to leave at 7.50 to be certain of arriving on time. And 35 minutes on average in the PM where he just kind of gets home when he gets home and it's just gonna be different every day. That's an hour 15 a day times 250 days, about 313 hours a year commuting. I'm not really gonna go through all the externalities exhaustively, pun intended, but just to say Caleb is on the hook for about 4,600 grams of CO2 a day or a little over a metric ton per year. The other externality I wanna mention is just the fact that by driving, he's imposing just a little bit of additional delay on everyone else in the transportation network, including the buses. And congestion is non-linear. Each additional car has an exponential impact on congestion. It's not additive. I don't really have time to get into it here, but if you're interested in like an explainer video, let me know down in the comments because I'd love to do it. The math for Tammy is a lot simpler. She maxes out her hop card at $100 a month times 12. $1,200 a year. Her commute is 30 minutes each way, so that's 250 hours over the course of a year. Note that a lot of employers subsidize transit passes, so she may be doing better than that. For CO2, I'm seeing the typical bus trip is at about 37% of what a car trip is, so that's about 1,700 grams a day, or 425 kilograms a year. Definitely fewer externalities than driving. Although she did have to spend like 250 hours of her life sharing public space with people who might not make as much money as her or be as well educated or I don't know, be as physically attractive. But she did the math and just kind of figured we live in a society. For Brianna, the monetary costs are super low. I don't know what depreciation is on a bike, but you can get a decent Jameis for like $500. And they last, I don't know, 10 years? Uh, I've biked in Portland for 22 years. I only ever had three bikes and I still have two of them. So depreciation is maybe $50 a year. Let's call maintenance $100 a year for a tune-up and the odd part here or there. So that's like $150 a year. And like with transit, some employers do bike commuter benefits. I had a job where they gave me like 20 bucks a month and I couldn't even really spend all of it. So her ride was 25 minutes in the AM, 30 minutes in the PM, times 250 days, that's 229 annual hours commuting. Let's get back to calories. Brianna was burning about 400 a day, which would be 100,000 calories a year. I don't want to make any grand statements about what that might mean for your personal body mass index. So bottom line, just give some thought to what 100,000 calories means to you personally. And think about what it means in terms of larger questions like long-term fitness and healthcare spending. As far as CO2, it's about 270 grams a day for Brianna, basically from the food she eats to generate the energy to bike. No other externalities to speak of really, except for the fact that by biking, she's basically saving the planet. So one criticism of what I've done here could be that the way I've set this whole competition up is really biased towards 
people who can afford to live in inner Southeast Portland. I mean, biking and transit are way less convenient if you live in, say, outer Southeast Portland. But that's kind of the whole point. There isn't really enough housing supply where we need it. Employment opportunities and urban amenities are always more prevalent when you're in close to the center of the city. And biking and transit and walking are always more competitive options in these locations. So I'm a transportation nerd, not a housing policy wonk, but we should be doing whatever we need to do to allow more people to live in those areas that are rich with employment opportunities and transportation options. Okay, end of rant. Quick wrap, here's a summary table. Pause the video if you need some extra time to nerd out. You know, I didn't talk about e-bikes at all. Let's just say it's gonna cost more than a regular bike and you're not going to get the same fitness benefits, but I'm pro e-bike. Heck, I'm pro scooter. Whatever it takes to get people out there. Other than that, I think my job here is done. Keep the great viewer suggestions coming and I'll be back with a new topic next week. See you then.